I guess, like a lot of research, uh, you start with a problem. So my problem was I found myself working with middle and high school students. Um, I hadn't planned on that, but there I was. And um, I knew from my coursework in language uh, disorders that I should be doing language samples on these kids. Um, but there weren't really good norms um, on the kind of um, expectations there are on students of that age. So specifically, I wanted to know um, what kind of um, standards are there for how well students explain something. Um, so that's when I kind of hooked up with um, researchers at University of Wisconsin, um, Madison, and then UW Milwaukee. Good. Yeah. So um, you know, the the problem was that. Uh, we didn't have an idea of what constituted normal for children uh, who, children's developing language. So um, we wanted to develop this database so that we could get some benchmarks uh, to establish what do we think is normal. So when we get our children with language impairments, we can compare them to this database to see what, what are their relative strengths and relative weaknesses. Um, and, and, you know, this database, uh, when we have this database and we use this clinically, we can use it for a couple of different purposes. One purpose is we can document the presence of the disorder, so just stating whether or not the, the child has a disorder. But something, you know, a really powerful part of the language sampling process is that you can develop a profile of children's relative strengths and weaknesses. This is what's so nice about those descriptive uh, assessments looking at real functional communication, is we can see our clients' relative strengths and relative weaknesses. And we can do this with the database. We can say, okay, you know, looking at these different dimensions of language, where do we see that you are, uh, you know, relatively comparable to your peers? Where do we see that you may be, uh, you know, a little delayed? And where do we see a major area that's a, a big difficulty for you? And these lend themselves very well to a uh, uh, treatment goal. So, so what we did with our research is that, uh, you know, we, we established these benchmarks. Then we also documented through a factor analysis that you can indeed capture these different dimensions of language. You can look at things like grammar and semantics, and you can look at productivity and, and how uh, fluently and, and, and coherently the, the child's getting their message out, how well their, their message is organized, what types of difficulties they're having. And you can really look at these different aspects of the language. Another really nice thing with, uh, with, with, with what we did is that this is really a, a, a contextual, a functional, uh, assessment. And I'll let Tom, Tom talk a little bit about how this is related to the curriculum. Yeah, so um, when you get to middle school, high school level, students um, aren't expected so much to, say, come up with a story. Uh, um, they're really expected to explain things like, um, you know, in science, how does the heart pump blood? Or in social studies, uh, what were the causes of the Civil War? And um, I could see that my students struggled with that. Um, but as John said, I didn't really have any way to say, this is how delayed they are. Um, the databases that were available, narration and conversation, when I tried to do those sorts of samples, I didn't really get a lot of language. Uh, the, the task didn't really engage kids. Um, so uh, after some trial and error, um, we came up with this favorite game or sport um, um, task. and. Um, after trying it on a few kids, including my, my own children, who were guinea pigs, um, I knew I had something. Um, my son at that point was in middle school, and you know, you'd ask him how his day was, and he's pretty typical, you know, you'd get a grunt or two. Um, <laughs> but if I asked him, I said, well, you know, why don't you explain how to play baseball? I want to tape that. You know, I'd get this elaborate explanation of uh, how you uh, shift on defense, and what's a perfect game, what's a no-hitter, and just all this elaborate detail. and. Um, that's what I found with other kids, too, when I tried it. So this is what kids should be talking about, but it also engages them. So we start off by saying there's a, a, a problem, right, that clinicians working with older students really don't have the norms available. So we hope that clinicians would look at this and say, OK, now I can take a language sample, and I can compare my student with typically developing students. So hopefully um, there will be more language sampling done. Um, standardized testing has its place, but as John said earlier, it primarily tells you if the child has a problem. Um, when you're working with older students, you already pretty much know they have a problem, and um, 
It's a matter of how do you attack it. You know, there's, there's a lot written. So this is within the assessment literature. And what we know we need to do in an, asse an assessment is identify the presence of the disorder and then really describe the student's relative strengths and relative weaknesses and try to find those areas that are going to be, uh, you know, prime for intervention. And the way we do that is through our descriptive assessments. So I, I, we hope that uh, this research shows the power of these descriptive assessments. Um, and, and, you know, not only the, the rationale for doing this study, that it's very curriculum-based, it's meaningful, it's important, but also the fact that we were able to document with our data that you can capture these different dimensions of language. It's hard to capture that with our standardized tests, with our norm reference tests. You know, usually those are more unidimensional where you're looking at one dimension of language, overall language ability. But, but we really showed that with these more descriptive assessments, you can capture these different aspects of language, looking at things like production ability and your ability to organize your discourse that are really meaningful and functional. And I, you know, our, our hope is that uh, we see more work done in this, uh, in the literature, to really expand our knowledge. I think, you know, from a theoretical perspective, really having an understanding of the variability that we see in language profiles can really help us start tackling that issue of the heterogeneity of language impairment. What do we know about language impairment? We know it's, it's extremely diverse. Children with language impairment are extremely diverse individuals. Um, so, we, you know, can we have a better way of capturing some of the subgroups and some of the profiles we see with language impairment? Um, as far as big surprises, I, I knew kids would rise to the occasion. I guess I was surprised at um, how the students at the lower end, the fifth and sixth graders, how they really held their own against um, the ninth graders. Um, and that really surprised me. Yeah, when we were looking at the data and, and doing analyses to see what type of age-related growth are we seeing, and we went from fifth graders through ninth graders. And, and, you know, when you have in your mind the difference between a fifth grader and ninth grader, I mean, it's, there, there's so much growth in that area. But the, the, the fifth graders really do have these pretty sophisticated language skills. We didn't see dramatic growth. We saw slow, steady growth. Um, but, uh, you know, it shouldn't, it, it's consistent with the literature. But again, it's, you know, nice having that uh, reminder and, and, and having that conclusion. Yeah, I think it's a reminder that um, if you ask kids about something that they know about and care about, you know, you'll get much better uh, in responses back than if you, it's just something you care about. As our follow-up to expository language, we collected persuasive language samples from uh, high school students, um, both in Wisconsin and also we partnered with an Australian researcher. So um, we have some Australian samples for the first time. Um, and this isn't persuasion, it's another skill that's expected of high school students, middle school for that matter too, and we don't really have good um, normative benchmarks. Um, I think the other area we want to head into is um, we want to collect samples from students with identified language impairments so that we can um, actually document that um, our protocols will um, show uh, that, um, I'm saying this wrong, we want to show that um, if we collect samples from language disordered kids, that they will look different from um, their typically developing peers. And then also be able to identify what type of profiles are we seeing across the children. Is language impairment unidimensional where we're just going to see across the board uh, impairments across all the different dimensions of language? We don't expect that, so we expect to see some you know, greater heterogeneity in the profile of, of uh, children with language impairment. And, uh, you know, if so, do we see some distinct profiles that show up more often than others? How stable are these profiles over time? So there's a, a lot of great questions, um, you know, and it, it fits into, you know, some of the broader passions, uh, I think, that we share. You know, one being working with older children, mm -hmm. um, older students. It's really, I, I never worked with, uh, clinically, with uh, older students, but, you know, the more that I've heard Tom talk about, uh, his experiences and that I've learned about the literature and, and engaged in this research, it's really just a fascinating time of development. Uh, you know, the, the complexity of language that these children produce is just really remarkable. Um, and I think it also, you know, fits into the broader goal of, um, of having descriptive, authentic, functional assess assessments and really being able to, to describe the skills that our, our students are having so we can best serve them.